Hi, my name is Fairley, and today I'm going to be presenting our, my results on characterizing alternative splicing in the ENCODE 4 mouse postnatal time course using both bulk and single nucleus long read RNA sequencing. So as you might know, alternative splicing plays a key role in development. And so here I'm just showing some processes in neural development that are regulated by these boxed splicing factors in neural development. So we have both Neural and glial cell lineages are regulated by splicing factors and alternative splicing of their targets, as well as neuronal migration and synaptogenesis. And when we want to study alternative splicing or alternative isoforms, it's ideal to use long read RNA sequencing because short read RNA sequencing cannot give us the full length exon connectivity and five and three prime ends of transcripts, whereas long read RNA sequencing can. For this project, we sequenced um, 92 libraries in bulk from for, of bulk long read RNA sequencing using PacBio for from five unique tissues in heart, adrenal gland, skeletal muscle, hippocampus, and cortex. And um, we sequenced these at seven postnatal developmental time points in both adrenal gland and gastrocnemius, um, which is the skeletal muscle but only a subset of these time points for the remaining tissues, where we're hoping to fill in the rest of it later. In addition, we also have matching long read single cell data called LR split seq data available for hippocampus and adrenal gland. So long read split seq, I just want to go over, um, is using a combinatorial barcoding strategy in order to uniquely barcode each individual cell or nucleus. And so typically what this consists of is um, using the first round of barcoding to barcode the cell's um, sample of origin, and then following it up by a unique and random path through a plate of different barcodes, which will give each cell a unique set of barcodes. And then we follow this up with PacBio um, or nanopore sequencing, as well as Illumina sequencing. So we end up with the same cells sequenced by both PacBio and, or sorry, by both long read and short read. And as just a brief overview for processing, both for the bulk and for the LR split seq data that we have, on the bulk side, um, it's a very typical workflow. We first map our reads, we then correct common long read sequencing artifacts such as microindels, and then we annotate reads to their transcripts of origin and filter novel transcripts. Using these novel transcripts and transcripts that are always annotated, we actually use that as our reference into the single cell or our LR split seq data because the LR split seq is not so great at being able to pick up on novel transcripts. So with the exception of an additional demultiplexing step and using a different reference, the LR split seq data processing pipeline looks identical. Although our pilot experiment for LR split seq was done solely using PacBio, we've actually recently integrated Oxford Nanopore um, sequencing in order to produce full length reads in our single cells. And what we find is that it tends to produce a similar proportion of usable reads at very much less of the cost. Um, so here I'm just indicating three different libraries. Um, from one from PacBio and two from Oxford Nanopore, and they're kind of like how the numbers of usable read changes or drops, you know, given each step of processing. And then on the right is just showing the number of UMIs per nucleus um, in Nanopore versus PacBio. So we're getting a lot more out of each individual cell with Nanopore than we did with PacBio. And it's also worth mentioning that the data seems to integrate readily well um, across the two technologies, although I did not show any results here. So um, just back to the bulk data, we see some interesting instances of isoform switching between our different time points here um, in hippocampus. So here what you're seeing is all of the isoforms expressed for GRIA2 in mouse hippocampus and cortex um, split by the different time points. And you're seeing the relative expression of each of the isoforms here. So from 0 to 100, 100 meaning that all of the genes expression is from that one isoform. And so what you're seeing is that um, in hippocampus specifically, we see a switch in the preference for the major isoform here. So we go from using this isoform down here 
to predominantly to this isoform up here predominantly. And the difference in these two isoforms is actually an exon switch right here, which I've tried to highlight, but it's a little difficult to see because it's very small. But it basically switches from having um, the exon that's shown in the pink for, to having the exon that's shown in the blue across the time course. On the single cell level, um, I just want to give uh, you know the classic overview of the cell types that we identify in both hippocampus and adrenal gland. And it's worth noting that we identify these cell types in the corresponding short read data and then project these labels, or just not even project, we just merge these labels into the corresponding cells from the long read data. So we, we find all the cell types that we'd expect to see in both hippocampus and adrenal. In terms of cell type specific isoform usage in the hippocampus, we see an interesting example in calmodulin um, between the microglia and the smooth muscle and ependymal cells um, specifically. So we can see that this isoform is the only one used um, in the microglia, whereas this top isoform is the only one used in these two cell types. And the other interesting thing to note here is that um, the oligodendrocytes seem to have a nearly equal expression of all three of these isoforms of the, um, of the gene. And we also see some interesting differences in terms of uh, SRSF1 expression in mouse adrenal glands. And SRSF1 is a particularly interesting gene because it is a splicing factor. And it is, a, it is well known that the alternative splicing of splicing factors is known to influence downstream splicing patterns. So um, this is this is an always an interesting gene to see pop up. And you can see its patterns of specificity in terms of expression between the cell types here as well, um, where you know the stromal cells and our SOX10 positive cells really strongly prefer to express this transcript, whereas you know, the other cells in the adrenal gland tend to express a mixture of these isoforms. In the future, I'm interested in using a tool um, that I wrote and have applied to an additional long read RNA sequencing data set to refine our three and five prime end calls from our long read data and use these five and three prime end calls to call switching events between our different cell types. Another thing that I'm interested in doing to integrate the adrenal and the hippocampus single cell data is comparing isoforms between the tissue resident immune cell populations, so the microglia in the hippocampus with the macrophages in the adrenal gland. And then finally, we have paired single nucleus attack seq data for some of these time points, and we're interested specifically in integrating our five prime end calls or differences that we see between cell types with the corresponding differences that we see in the single nucleus attack to see if we can link the alternative promoter usage to alternative promoter accessibility or co-accessibility of um, additional regions. And with that, I'd like to thank the large group of people for, who have made this uh, work possible. And I'd also like to thank you for your time.